company. Um, we do that in three ways. So the first is that we manage and invest charitable funds. Um, right now we have $128 million in uh, charitable assets, and that's uh, from 258 funds in our family. And that language is, is very specific and very purposeful. About half of those are donor advised funds, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And then the rest include nonprofit funds, scholarship fund, field of interest funds um, as well. The second um, pillar of our mission is really around strengthening and supporting you all, the nonprofit um, community. In 2021, we dispersed $18.1 million in grants um, and, and certainly um, more than $9 million in our, our COVID relief efforts. But also, uh, perhaps I could see a show of hands for those of you who have, who have attended our Institute for Trustees in the past or some other kind of capacity building workshop, um, certainly here to support, support the nonprofit community as much as we can. And then finally, um, the, the third piece of our, um, of our mission here is you know, it's a focus on partnering with our communities. Um, we invest in systems-based community leadership work that's really focused on those areas that are identified as critical across the entire um, county. So you might be familiar with our Creative County Initiative, our Empowering Economic Opportunity, um, and most recently are advancing um, the digital equity. So big, big um, investment opportunities where we can come together, catalyze uh, the resources to make a difference on a leadership level. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jen, and we're gonna get into the meat here. So you're here to learn about a nonprofit fund at ECCF. So very specifically, what is it? Um, it's a cost-effective and efficient charitable investment fund to support and sustain a nonprofit organization's medium to long-term operations and goals. And there's a few things that I just wanna continue to call out here. So the funds that you would consider to be invested as part of a nonprofit fund are those that you are setting aside for, medium to, for a medium to long-term purpose. These are to be seen entirely different than your checking account, than your operating account that you're sort of dipping into on a monthly basis. You know, because these funds are ultimately invested, the benefit comes when you have a longer view for their use, ultimately, right? So they can stay invested. Um, consider these as assets that you would have set aside for a rainy day, um, that you would have um, set aside perhaps, perhaps for an upcoming you know, big opportunity, or something that you're looking to um, hopefully create a form of sustained income on an annual basis. Um, as we just talked about, you know, ECCF's one of our core competencies is to invest and manage charitable funds. And this nonprofit fund is, specific, is a specific investment vehicle that functions to support nonprofits, which is also another incredibly important element of our mission. So this is a, a representation of those two um, pillars coming together um, to support you. You can go to the next one, Jen. Um, so how does it actually work? Okay, everybody buckle up. No, I'm just kidding. Um, first, as a nonprofit organization, you establish a nonprofit fund yourself as a 501c3. Contributions then flow from your nonprofit organization into the fund that you set up. You'll see the word agency here, just slip it, flop it out for, um, flip it out for, um, for nonprofit fund. So you are the nonprofit, you establish the fund, contributions flow from your organization into the nonprofit fund. Those funds are invested, they ultimately um, grow over time, which is always the goal. And then grants come out of that agency fund back to your organization. So it is a cyclical um, relationship here. And that's made very special by the fact that the establishing organization is a 501c3 nonprofit. And then we as a community foundation are a 501c3 nonprofit, which allows for that um, to happen. So, so it can be quite simple in, in its structure. Um, next, Jen. <clears throat> so there are two types of uh, nonprofit funds at ECCF. The first is a reserve fund. The second is an endowed fund. In the next slide, we're gonna talk specifically around the difference between what those are, but right now we're gonna talk about the, the similarities. Um, the initial investment for both is, and the uh, minimum balance that needs to be maintained in the fund is $25,000. Assets are invested into one of ECCF's investment pools, which we're gonna talk about the difference between the two. Um, while this, this next bullet seemingly flies in the face of what I just said in the last slide, meaning we can accept a variety of, of assets into the fund, um, there is an opportunity here, should you have a donor 
that wants to give um, perhaps a complex, a more complex asset into the fund than your organization can, than, can accept. So just a very simple um, example here. You have a donor who really wants to give into a nonprofit fund that you've established at ECCF, and they have a gift, they wanna give appreciated securities. ECCF can accept that gift on behalf of the organization, but that um, asset needs to stay invested in the fund. So this isn't a brokerage account where something's gonna come in and out. Um, and we can dive into that, but it is, it is an opportunity um, for you to think about how these funds can build your capacity from that perspective with your donors. Um, you have access to your fund information via a donor portal that's 24 seven. And we're starting to dig into probably some of the questions that we hear a lot, which is, how do I know where my money is? Is it my money? Um, and again, we're gonna dive into that too. But being a part of uh, the fund family of funds with a nonprofit fund means you continue to access education and training. We talked about the IFT, our nonprofit fund holders um, receive four free tickets, the Institute for Trustees, our commitment to continuing to build the capacity of the organization. And then also this sense of ongoing partnership with ECCF. You know, we have seen more and more interest in these types of funds um, in the last six to eight months. And we're starting to understand that maybe there um, is a particular um, you know, educational or training need that is connected to these nonprofit fund holders that come to us. And we're willing to engage in that kind of conversation um, as, we, as we move forward. Um, I wanna make a quick side note here that you know, many of you know ECCF because of the grant making side of the house. The grant making side of the house is completely separate from this side of the house that we're talking here. So any um, grant making decisions that are made you know, consider the it is not considered in any way um, whether you have a nonprofit fund here or not. Um, that's never part of the conversation. So just want to at least throw that out there. Jen, um, can you go to the next one, please? So we're going to dive into very briefly the difference between a reserve fund and an endowed fund. And really overall, the main difference is in how you are able to access the assets in the fund. So just starting on the reserve fund side of things. So a nonprofit that has a reserve fund can access the full balance of the fund at any time. Um, in the fund setup process, your organization would identify um, authorized representatives, typically a, a few members of the board who have the ability to request a distribution from the fund via email. So you make the request, we process the request, and then ultimately we put a check in the mail. We don't take expenditure responsibility, for these funds, they are yours and they are to be used, they can be used at, at your discretion, at the board's discretion. Um, and so a reserve fund then becomes aligned really mostly with goals that are um, associated with um, reserve funds, something put aside for a rainy day or for a medium to longer term goal like a capital campaign. That might be a, a good opportunity for um, a reserve fund to be utilized. On the other side of it is the endowed fund. And so again, it's, it's about how you access the funds. So funds available in an endowed fund to the organization would be available based on ECCF's spending policy. Um, our spending policy currently right now is 4.5% of the market value of all the endowed funds over the preceding 20 quarters. Again, we can talk about that in depth in the question and answer session if we need to. Um, the funds are accessed in the same way, through the same process. So your authorized representatives request a distribution, um, again, up to the amount that is calculated from that percentage. We don't take expenditure responsibility here as well. Um, and, and the check is cut as well. I, I think the difference here really is that an endowed fund um, is, is quite special in that um, there are assets that are set aside for, you know, real, for an organization that has the ability to support some longer term goals. You know, you're essentially asking ECCF to, you know, kind of lock up the principal, right? To keep and protect the principal balance of this fund so that it can be invested and that it can grow. Um, and so you're limiting the amount of access that you have to it on an, on an annual basis so that you can preserve that principal balance. Um, the higher the principal balance, the more it will become available for disbursement and, and sort of on and on. So um, endowed funds are, are utilized, you know, in, in sort of the best scenarios as, as a source of, of income, um, reliable income on an annual basis. You don't need to take a disbursement from either of these funds um, on, in any particular year, 
um, and anything that you don't take is, is reinvested back in. So the one question that I imagine, or I imagine there's two questions that are coming up here and I'm gonna touch on them and then we can dive deeper into it. Um, the first is, well, what happens if I have an endowed fund and I really need to dip into the principal? Um, there is a, uh, a clause within the agreement that says, in the case of extreme circumstances, your board can vote to unlock the principal balance. Again, the purpose of these funds is for um, long-term goals and planning. So we become your sort of partner in, in keeping that principal balance um, separate and protected. But if something horrific happened within your organization and you needed to, that's something that your board could, re could request and then ECCF would um, you know, ultimately consider. And, I, and this is, you know, uh, let's just say we would, we would, it's not within our interest to keep the money from you should you need it, given that they are for a charitable purpose that you have um, set aside. Um, in both cases, the assets in these funds remain on your balance sheet um, as an organization. Um, they also are on ECCF's balance sheet, but they exist on our balance sheet as both an asset and a liability. They have to be an asset of the community foundation so that we can invest them, but they also become a liability for us as well because we know that ultimately they are your assets and they can be returned given all of these sort of parameters. There's a lot that I said there. Again, we will dive into it and um, Britt is here to help as a CFO to, to offer more um, detail. So with that, Jen, I'll turn it over to you to dive into some of the investment information. Perfect, sorry, I was just letting in some late stragglers. Um, so it, when we think about over the past two years um, and the difficulties that you all have faced in terms of focusing on your mission, you know, you may have found yourself thinking, well, I wish I had time to focus on investment management, or maybe we don't have that um, in, within our organization. And we at ECCF, we've spoken about this. That is one of our core competencies. Our core competencies is to invest and manage charitable assets. And the way we do it is we focus on a long-term total return strategy. Um, so we have an investment committee that is made up of five investment professionals with over a hundred years combined investment experience. And they focus on a passive management style um, with proactive asset allocation. So we have developed these investment pools um, through our years and years of managing charitable assets. And we will, our intention with this product is to offer you the opportunity to leverage our investment expertise while allowing you to focus on your mission and on what you do best. Um, so, like I said, our investment philosophy is a passive management style of underlying asset class. So that means that we have a proactive al asset allocation, but we're not stock pickers. Um, our investment pools have a broad debt equity allocation ratio. They allocate within various sectors. Um, they select managers within those sectors, but they do not focus on specific stocks. Um, and that investment strategy is targeted for steady asset growth, um, but managing risk and cost as well. So when the investment committee is evaluating managers, they're looking at how well their performance is, but also that they're not, um, you know, a high cost in investment manager as well. Um, the real underlying strategy here is to uh, preserve and grow real purchasing power of underlying assets. So we wanna ensure that these charitable assets are growing at at least the rate of inflation to allow that the dollars today will still be able to have the same purchasing power or more um, in the future. Um, and I mentioned that our investment committee is a dedicated group of investment professionals that um, focus on maintaining our investment management strategy. Um, they guide our investment policy they are the ones who determine our asset allocation and manager selection, and they meet routinely to go through investment performance. So what are these investment pools then? Um, well, we offer two investment choices, one being a general fund and one being an ESG fund. So I'll start with the general fund, which is your broad-based global balanced investment strategy that invests across the board in debt and equities. 
Um, the goal is to provide a long-term total return that exceeds the rate of consumer price inflation. Again, maintaining that real purchasing power of the assets. Um, this current split is 65% in equities, 35% in bonds. Um, and it had almost $100 million in assets in the general fund at the end of August. Um, you can see here our 12-month return in our general fund was 22.4%. And while I would love to say that that is a typical return, we have to keep in mind that um, when we think of August 2020, uh, the stock mar market was still in the early stages of rebound. So that is a little bit of an inflated return number given it's coming off of a low base. Um, so that's why I wanted to also highlight the three-year return of 12.3%. Um, so it is showing you that we are you know, targeting this real growth in assets, and we are able to achieve that over the long term, um, given the three-year return of 12.3%. So then the ESG fund is a new fund that we started in March of 2019. And ESG, you may be familiar with it. It stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. Um, and this fund seeks to invest in um, managers and who invest in companies that focus on um, kind of proactive social responsibility. So for example, um, companies in the ESG fund would not, um, we would not include gun manufacturers, fossil fuels, alcohol, tobacco, et cetera. There's a whole um, list of screening that, uh, that the ESG fund and the ESG managers go through um, to make sure that the companies that they're investing in follow the guidelines um, of proactive social responsibility. You can see that in this fund, the debt equity split is, a, is the same as a general fund, 65% equities, 35% debt. Um, and it's smaller given it, it's recently um, been introduced at 13.2 million in assets. It has about the same return um, over the 12 months of 22.3%. And we can only show you a long-term return from our uh, inception date of March, 2019 of 46.2%. Again, keeping in mind that that is based off of a, a very low point in the stock market. Um, so generally, these are our investment choices. We can go through any specific questions you have when we have the question and answer session. But I do want to highlight that because of our size, um, we have over $100 million uh, in assets being invested in the market. Um, we are able to leverage um, economies of scale and portfolio diversification, which allows for also lower investment fees than um, investing in smaller amounts. So because of our volume, we are able to get lower investment fees um, than maybe a one, two, three million dollar fund would be able to get. And we pass those savings on to our nonprofit fund holders. So speaking of fees, what are the fees? Well, we have two layers of fees for our nonprofit funds. So the first is our foundation fee. And this is based on a sliding scale of fund size. And you can see the scale there. So for funds under a million dollars, we charge 75 basis points. Um, for funds between a million and 5 million, it's 50 basis points. And for fund sizes larger than 5 million, it's 25 basis points. Um, and then we charge uh, investment fees on the investment pools. So each investment pool, that's you know, kind of your typical broker dealer fees. Um, and the general fund is a slightly lower fee at 43 basis points. The ESG fund ha has a 52 basis point fee. And our investment returns that you will see are net of those investment fees. And then either investment choice is subject to an investment oversight fee of 25 basis points. What's important to keep in mind here is while these fees sound like a lot, we wanted to show that in actual dollars, it is not a large amount of money. So $100,000 invested in the ESG fund would have a $750 annual foundation fee. And that foundation fee will be deducted on a monthly basis um, from your net investment returns in your, and you can see that in your donor portal. Um, and the last point is that foundation fees are reinvestment into the community because they support our work at ECCF. Um, and so they support, you know, those three areas, um, including, you know, nonprofit support, um, systems philanthropy. 
uh, those go back into our operating budget and allow us to reduce our reliance on, on fundraising um, for our, our annual operations. All right, Stacey, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome, thank you, Jen. Um, and we're just about on time here to have a, a really robust question and answer session. And so I wanna um, just leave you with, you know, maybe this is the question that you're asking yourself and it's the right question, right? Is the nonprofit fund at ECCF right for us? Um, and, you know, as you are considering whether the answer is yes or no, or which kind or when, you know, there's some really key and important strategic um, conversations to be had. This isn't something that happens on a whim. All of the organizations we've worked with up to this point, you know, there's been processes to consider policies that were in place or not in place. There were conversations with different committees on the board and then as a board as a whole. And so it's really just to say to you that if this is the beginning of a process to you, um, then that's great. Um, and we are here as a resource and as a partner, that sense of partnership really begins right now in the discovery of how this might be a fit for your organization. Something I did want to leave you with is just something that we are hearing from donors and from nonprofit organizations who are opening these funds is that, you know, donors are really open to having different conversations around sustainability and what they're giving um, can do to an organization in, in a post-pandemic world. Um, and they really like this sense of uh, the opportunity to give long-term assets or, or non-cash assets that can be invested for the long-term. Um, they like the fact that leadership remains focused on what the organization is, is established to achieve, the mission it is out there to, um, to accomplish, and that the community foundation ultimately ends up being the partner um, feels right in the sense of understanding what, what these charitable dollars are meant to do and how to really leverage the impact of those. So um, there's a lot to think about. There's a lot of information that we just shared right now. And so Jen, why don't we just sort of stop sharing for now the screen um, and open it up to questions um, that you might have. If you wanna just raise your hand um, using your Zoom tools, if you know how to do that. Um, okay, great, I see one here. Um, Sorry, reststopranch.org, is that you, Mary? Hey guys, so when we were looking at the um, fees for the funds, if we had 25,000, um, we would be charged 0 0.75. Can you, just, can you just walk that through? Because we're concerned that it would be up to 2% fees. Um, and it, can you just walk me through the math? Sure, yeah, we can. Um, so you would be charged 75 basis points as a foundation fee. The investment fees are those, the broker dealer fees. So those will come out net of, of your investment returns. That, that's basically, you know, just being part of the investment pool. And then there's a 25 basis point fee on top of it. So on your statement, you would see basically um, your asset balance, that would be net of investment fees. And then you would see a an investment oversight fee that would have come out and then the foundation fees. So it's it's not 2% fees. Okay. Um, does that answer? I'm with my CFO. Does that answer your question, CFO? The, uh, are you investing in other managed funds that have their own fees that we're gonna have a little cut on as well? No? No, so that's what that um, the, the total investment management fee encompasses is all of the fees that it it charges us within the pool. That's why that's why they're different for each pool. What's the required minimum distribution from the funds for both the general fund and the uh, in, per, in perpetuity fund? Um, there isn't necessarily a required. Beth, I'll look to you even to that question. We don't. Do you want to answer it? I have to find my unmute button. Uh, there's no uh, required distribution for um, for nonprofit funds. Um, we do have an activity policy for our donor advised funds and some of our other funds, but for the nonprofit fund, if you are an endowed fund, we 
uh, it's a 4.5% spend policy. However, you can choose to keep that in the balance, um, to put it back into the principal, keep it in the fund, which becomes uh, as a part of the principal moving forward. Um, and But there is no minimum distribution for a nonprofit fund. If you don't need it, if, it, if you're acting, if you're using it as a rainy day fund or a part of your liquidity policy and you don't need it, you don't take it. Um, it just continues to stay in the principal and continues to be um, in the investment. It, it, it's my understanding as a charity rest stop branch in this case has to spend down any of its assets at I think four and a half percent or five percent per year. This counts against our assets though, right? So if we don't spend it from the fund, we have to spend it from somewhere else. So are you a private foundation? We're a 501c3 um, incorporated. I don't know much about what we're doing right now, so... <laughs> Um, my understanding is that that's just a the five percent requirement is a private foundation requirement. Okay. So unless you're an operating foundation, which could operate like a five hundred one c three, then you then you do need to spend five percent. But I can't advise advise you on that. Okay. You would have to spend five percent to if you are if you operate like a private foundation, your five percent is on your total assets. Um, and so it can come from elsewhere as well, but you need to seek advice. Don't, I, I can't give you that. No advice. worries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do, I do want to say one thing. I do want to say one thing about um, minimum required distribution. You're not, but um, this isn't a checkbook. This is long-term investment. So don't think about it like, oh yeah, I can draw down twice a month and I don't, I, I can use it. it. We're not, we're not designed nor set up that way. It, we are investing for the long-term uh, for total return. So anyway, um, yeah. I just want to be clear on that. What we're Great. looking at is is a, establishing a fund that can run or provide assets for our nonprofit uh, after our death. Uh, so we're looking to make sure that there's sufficient funds there that the, the nonprofit has an annual sustaining, uh, you know, re receipt of funds. Corpus, right. Yeah, and let, let me make a note to follow up with you separately just to understand kind of the full situation. Um, because like we said, there's other types of, of charitable funds that, again, given the specific situation we can talk about, but I will follow up with you and- um, I'll, I'll leave it to the rest of the floor for other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I see you have a question. Yeah, and I'll in a minute I'll figure out how to take my hand down. <laughs> uh, first of all, am I? I have a couple of questions. Am I correct that the fund setup at ECCF is independent of donor restrictions? In other, I mean, one example would be we could put funds into an endowment fund that are not donor restricted. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, what roughly what would you define medium term as? I would say I will give you the yeah generic oh, answer is it depends for every organization, um, and then I'll <laughs> let Britt sort of give you some guide rails to maybe think through that. Um. So oh, okay. You said you said depends. Um. I guess. I guess I would think uh, four to four to seven years. I think is a is a is a reasonable time frame to think about this. It shouldn't be something that, you know, if you're planning in your long term strategic plan as an organization to look for, you know, to to grow a corpus for something, uh, then this is where it is. It's not bricks and mortar, right? We're not investing in a building here. Um, this is to provide uh, income to you and continue to grow the purchasing power of your assets. Um, not a checkbook. So in your asset stack, it's definitely lower on your asset stack um, than kind of ready cash or, uh, or anything that would be touched within the three to five year, within three years. So this is, and this would be, and I'm thinking of working with my finance committee, this would be um, beyond the cash reserves that you know that you're targeting trying to meet three months of operating yes. costs or whatever much so. so this is definitely beyond that as the rainy day type of thing yes. okay thank you um i saw bonnie raised your hand and then you took it down i just want to make sure 
Bonnie, if you want a chance to ask a question. Okay, maybe not. Oh, no, okay. Um, let's go to Martha. Did you raise your hand? I did, thank you. Um, are you yourselves a registered investment advisor? No, we are not. I am a CFA, but I'm not a registered investment advisor. Okay. And um, did I understand correctly that you're invested in 258 funds? No. No, that forgive was, me. Yeah. No, we, I, we have, we are a family of funds. So um, those are representative of individual donors, families, businesses, oh, organizations. See who have chosen to partner with ECCF to invest their charitable dollars and to partner with us on their philanthropy. Does so those are the investor funds coming in. Yes. Can I <clears throat> you give me um, a rough idea of the number of funds that would be invested in and in, in say the managing, you know, the charitable funds, medium term program? So we have, so, so the number of nonprofit funds that we have right now um, as an organization, it's a mix of reserve funds and endowed funds. Um, but the total count, I believe was, we have 16 total nonprofit funds and totaling a, a little more than $19 million um, in charitable assets. So 16 funds that the funds are invested in. So 16, oh, you're talking about, yeah. Do I'm you want to show, Jen, do you wanna show, yeah. Is it helpful, do you think, Jen and Britt, to, to pull up maybe the investment performance and to just talk through? Sure, we can do it, we can do it that way. Um, uh, <clears throat> so um, what, Jen, what um, Jen is showing right now is our ESG fund. We have two funds like the general and ESG. The ESG fund right now invests in these, roughly seven funds, right? The Vanguard um, Social Index Admiral, the Calvert Small Cap, uh, a couple of ETFs, uh, ESG Awareness, um, as well as some fixed income um, for the social fixed income, as well as Calvert High Yield Bond and the Vanguard um, uh, <coughs> Intermediate Term. Um, so those are the seven funds that the ESG fund invests in. If we were to go to the other one, which would be the general fund, I think they're more like eight or nine. One, two, three, three. they're nine. Uh, yeah. um, so, and then the general fund only invests in those. Uh, what our uh, investment committee does is it allocates into those various areas. So for example, the PIMCO income fund is a uh, broadly diversified uh, corporate bond fund um, managed by PIMCO. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, and that's just one instance of one of the funds that we invest in. Okay. Um, so does that, right. there's does a that lot of funds and question. funds. And, Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Those okay. things being, we're, different, same words being thrown around to mean a couple of yeah. different yeah, things. So just I, I appreciate little, the clarification. You can, and, and these are, on, these are on our website and I'm going to put the links in the chat so you can peruse Thank them. You. And, and, and we'll and follow up one, with this. One more. Can I ask one more question on, on fees? I'm sorry to go back to fees again, but my understanding is you charge a 75 basis point fee and then the blended rate of the fees for the funds themselves that you're invested in charge the other fee. Is that the correct understanding? Yes, um, I, I'm sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so we have, the foundation fee, right, which is the 75 basis points. We have an investment oversight fee, which we'll also see come out, but then the investment management fee, um, either 43 basis points or 52 basis points, depending on which fund you're in. And that is the fees that um, the various components end up charging us. And that will come out uh, before performance. So you won't see those fees. Right, right. Okay. Right. I, thank you. For that clarification. Any other questions? And there was maybe one in the chat, I think, Jen. Did you see? Okay, I think we covered that. Okay. Okay, you've got the floor. You go for it. <laughs> um, 
I'm curious about just how actively um, the investment committee changes funds and realigns if there's any, you know, just how actively and you're involved or is it something that kind of runs on for the most part with periodic asset reallocation? I mean, would you react to, um, you know, a major event in the world or, you know, threats about the debt ceiling not being approved? Um, so and the, um, the, the investment professionals are in this every day. So they do, they're on the, they're what, on their Bloombergs and, and investing their clients' assets every day. So we benefit from their knowledge of what happens in the market. Um, we are, uh, we obviously look forward in what we think we would see in the future. To give you an example, when, corona, when coronavirus hit last March, um, the decision by the investment committee was not to do a knee-jerk reaction and pull everything out. This is long-term uh, sustainability. And with a 65-35 split, we feel fairly comfortable to, um, to, handle, uh, to handle shocks in the market, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. Um, debt ceiling and things like that, yes, they are concerned about it. Uh, our most recent investment committee meeting last month was very concerned about short duration bonds and the corporate and high yield spread differential. Uh, there was a lively discussion about that uh, and what to do about it. We will, take, we will take action in certain areas to say, listen, we wanna take our fixed income exposure and, and move it to a shorter duration um, scenario with the, with the rise of inflation okay. and, um, and things like that. I'll give you another example. In February of last, in February of this year, um, we came across a, um, uh, an international small cap equity person who, thought, who uh, has been producing good returns. So we took some of our international equity exposure and moved it into smaller uh, term, uh, excuse me, smaller company international stock exposure. Uh, and that's, that's, um, that fund has done particularly well since then. So it's that type of stuff, but we will not do knee-jerk reactions. Uh, we are in this for the long term. Uh, so, so various mm -hmm. kind of debt ceiling things like are already in the market because of interest rates and inflation and stuff like that. But for the most part, um, we won't we won't respond uh, in a in a knee-jerk reaction. Thanks. And and I had one more question if we still have time. Sure. Um, you mentioned, and this is a broader one, you mentioned non-cash gifts. And so we are able in-house to accept securities, which we are getting a little bit more of. And I think we're seeing more alternative ways of, of planned giving. And I'm wondering um, beyond the um, nonprofit funds that we're talking about today, are there things you're doing to help support some of, support us um, with different types of planned giving. Um, for example, I had a situation a couple of years ago where somebody wanted to do a charitable gift annuity, which we ended up being able to accommodate with a lot of um, research and all that. But just curious of, of where the ECCF is in terms of um, supporting other kinds of planned giving. Um, to speak generally, um, I think it's always worth the conversation to talk about every, you know, individual donor that you might be uh, having a conversation with. I say that because um, other types of funds that we offer, for example, something called a designated fund, is a fund that a donor could open with a um, a, a, a complex asset. We also um, review all gifts of complex assets on a case by case basis. I see Beth looking at me, making sure that I say that. Um, and Britt, um, to then say, okay, you know, this person could, I could identify, I could open up a, a designated fund, which ultimately um, is a fund that's set up to make an annual distribution to a nonprofit or nonprofits that are designated within the agreement. And ECCF sort of manages that piece of it. So that could be a vehicle that we would be able to sort of offer to your donor as a, almost like a pass-through, right, to your um, organization. But um, 
you know, uh, it, again, case by case basis, certainly I'm considering any kind of, of non-cash gift. Um, and then any, I, I think it's just a, a great thing, Kay, for you, that you bring up. Give us a call in those particular scenarios and let's talk through it. Let's see what we can um, help with or, or where else we can sort of, how else we can think through some of that with you. Any other burning questions? We have about 10 minutes left. Um, all questions are good questions. Um, I will tell you that um, after this uh, time today, we'll follow up with a lot of the information that you saw here today, um, information on our investment options and fees and that sort of thing. And, and we're happy to follow up um, with each of you individually, but it looks like David, you have a question. So the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, by the way, this is awesome. I think what you're doing is, is great. Um, so how long, I, maybe you said this, I know that there was a mention of, I think over a couple of hundred, of different clients and organizations you work with. Um, so how long have you been doing this for people outside of your own organization or organiza organizations other than yourself? Do you, do you want me to answer that, Stacey? So look, uh, look about, um, the community foundation. So we're 23 years old um, as a community foundation. We were originally started um, to do nonprofit capacity building. And quickly, uh, the founders learned that what nonprofits need were um, connections to donors, and hence the Community Foundation was born. So over, um, which, which then became a charitable asset um, organization, um, different funds could be established, and grant making um, could be connected to the nonprofits who had passion areas that the donors were interested in. And so fast forward 23 years, um, that's the 260 funds that we've grown into. Um, so we have 260 funds, all 90% um, uh, of them donor advised, meaning that there's a group of individuals who, who are making uh, grant making recommendations um, or couples, uh, a married couple or a brother sister combo. Um, and so every one of the 260 are different, um, but we have been managing and investing um, those funds um, for the last 23 years. Does that give you a little bit? And, and just perspective, people you will, are usually familiar with the Boston Foundation. They're over a hundred years old. Um, and so we're still a teenager, um, but we're growing pretty fast. And we're, we're looking at other ways that we can bring value to the communities that we serve. And this nonprofit fund is, is one type of way that we can do that amongst the other ways that Stacy had already talked about. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions or anything, Britt, that you or Jen um, or Beth or anything that we want to just sort of reiterate here before we let everybody enjoy the rest of their day? No, I will. I do want to say one thing about um, where we fit in and a little bit as, as I'm sure a lot of you see, your cash really isn't earning much today. Um, and actually, you're losing money as far as the purchasing power. And I know Jen talked about it. Um, but if inflation, you know, is three to three point six percent, and you're only earning fra a fraction of a percent on your money market or whatever you have your cash, it's an interesting thing to do the exercise with your board to think about segregating some money um, to really to put it work for you. I get the constraint that you're all under in the operating budget, but um, to really think long term, we have had um, a lot of charities have had a windfall from COVID. Um, uh, and some haven't, but a lot of them have, and they've thought about ways to put that money to work in the market. Um, yes, it's riskier, but I think it preserves the purchasing power of your assets, which in the long term is the best for, for you as an organization. So I'll stop there. The only, the only thing I would add, I'll share a story, um, which talks to the point about giving us a call, right? So we, every... When I say, so just to give you perspective, there's 4,000 registered nonprofits that reside in Essex County, okay? 4,000, mm -hmm. um, About 1,500 of them are what you would think of like social service, grassroots organizations doing work in the community. But, but we, we keep, we understand and know that. So I guess my point is to say, every one of them has a different purpose, a slightly different tweak on something. So pick up the phone and call, and we're happy to talk through with you whether or not a nonprofit fund here makes sense, 
or what um, types of assets or questions that you're dealing with that help you achieve your mission in investing dollars, right? So we're happy to have those conversations. And I'll use one example, real life story with you, which is a nonprofit here in Essex County who um, right before COVID was, they, they were, um, they had a, a CD, a $100,000 CD come to term, right? And so they're like, look, I'm getting 1.4% or whatever it was on the CD return. And I'm looking at your, cause they had an endowed fund with us as well. I'm looking at your returns on your website and, it, and, and I'm wondering to myself why we're not taking that $100,000 and investing it more in long-term. We, we don't have any intention of needing it or using it right now. It's part of our liquidity policy that we have to have access to it. And so it was a conversation trying to figure out what, the, what should it be endowed? Should it not be endowed? Um, how often would we need the reserve? And so they wanted to put, to Britt's point, they wanted to put those resources to more working use um, for a stronger return than what they could see in the CD. And so I just share that one example that that's a specific need that they had. We had a conversation and put it into the best place um, possible. We have other nonprofit funds who are very interested in this ESG model. And so they've actually taken half of their fund and invested it in ESG and the other half invested in the general fund and they're watching it, right? They're watching to see what the returns are going to be and can they give, can, can they see those returns marry each other? Um, and so they're using it as a test and a pilot because they wanted to see how they could, they could get into the ESG market in a lower cost basis than what their provider was, was charging them um, in, in the, external market. And so anyway, so every person, every nonprofit seems to have a different purpose. So we're happy to have the conversation with you about what are you trying to achieve? And if we are a good fit for that, great. And if we are not, we're going to tell you, you know, you might be better off going here. If you want to be in a very specific type of fund and the ESG fund doesn't, because it's a, it's a very basic screening, it's a good ESG screening, but it may not achieve what you want to achieve. We're going to tell you that. <laughs> Um, so I just share that to say we're, we're, we want to be as transparent with you as possible, and it's really about achieving your goals, and if, and if we can help you do that, great, and if we can advise you otherwise, great as well. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Beth, as a, a segue really to wrapping up here. You know, this kind of presentation is very broad and general to just sort of introduce um, this opportunity of partnership with, uh, with ECCF, but the, the real um, as Beth said, the real important conversations are on an individual basis to see where you are and to have that conversation. So um, I see you, Martha, I'm gonna let you ask a question, but I'm just gonna let you know in terms of follow-up that Jen and I will be reaching out to each of you with um, the information that we shared in this presentation, the PowerPoint and some additional resources, and then with an offer to just schedule a phone call to say, what did you think about that? Where do you think that you are? What do you think might be the next steps? That's how all of the process has happened in all of our nonprofit funds up to this point. We're happy to meet with executive committees or finance committees um, and to answer all those really specific questions. And also to know that this isn't about something that needs to happen like that, that this is, this is really about partnership in the long term. So um, we can, we're happy to, uh, to offer that and, and please do take us up on that um, as you can. And then Martha, do you wanna ask one more question? And then- I, I'm sorry um, to ask, a, yeah, I'm sorry to ask a really, really basic question here, but- um, <laughs> what we would be putting our money into is effectively a private fund. Is that correct? So the documentation would be that of a private fund. It's commingled. It's not like a separate uh, account that is managed all in the same way. Is that correct? Yeah, you're, you're investing a pool of, a pool of assets, right? Um, and then when you, you will have 24 seven access to it through the donor portal. So you know where the money and what it is, but yes, it's a pool a part of a general pool or an ESG pool uh, that, that you're investing in. Does that, is that making sense? Um, well, I just want to know what it is that we have. Is it, it, is the documentation that we would sign as we send our money to you that of a single fund. So say we want to be in the reserve fund um, and that would be well, fund you, documentation. Or are you going to take that money and invest it in 16 funds for us? 
if you tell us if you tell us you want to be in the general fund we will take that money and put it into our general fund pool um, so see. it'll be invested across those nine different um based on an based on our asset mix of those nine different funds and the reserve fund and the endowed fund are really there they are there's a difference between those two and how you actually access the 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 balance of the fund so in either case you could have either a reserve fund or an endowed fund and then you would get to choose an investment strategy and your investment strategy would either be to go into the general fund or into the ESG fund or a combination of the two and then with a so I know it's the it's the fund and the fund I get it Martha the, I'm going to language specifically yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll we will walk through it no worries Thank you. And everyone and everyone has their own personal nonprofit named fund. So that's the thing that's confusing because it's called a fund, but that's not really the investments. That's just the name of your container. So as an example, if the nonprofit is called Youth on Board or something like that, it'd be called the Youth on Board Fund. And the Youth on Board Fund would have $100,000 in it that you would, you would allocate towards that, Martha. And then that $100,000 would be invested in the pool funds that Britt and Stacy were talking about. Right. But you would have access to that youth on board, you know, container, and that would be your allocation, which you could deploy how you wish, but it'd be invested in a general fund or an, an ESG uh, fund. Thank you very much. Great. Um, as always, we thank you so much for your time, for your interest. Um, we, you've heard it 10 million times. You heard, you'll hear it 10 million more. We're here as your partner. Um, and again, we will follow up with you and we look forward to, to learning how we can support you. Um, so thank you all very much for your, your hard work every day. <laughs>